this evening as you know we return to our our little series on on questions that people ask about christianity series that we've entitled i need an answer to help us understand our our own faith the the reasonableness the logic in our own faith and to help us explain our faith to to answer these questions gen, genuine questions that the people have at times our faith and Christianity and why we believe what we believe. And this evening we, we come to a slightly change the, the, the question as I originally planned it, I think this time last year, but change the question to who is Jesus? Originally I think the question was, is Jesus just a good man? But I've, I've changed it to who is Jesus to cover all the, the different options that the people think about Jesus. Who is Jesus? He is the central character in the Christian faith, the character whose person and work is the focus of the Gospels and the, the epistles, the one in whom salvation rests, Jesus. And being the central character, being the focus of the Gospels, being the one in whom salvation, we're told in the Bible, rests, your acceptance or your rejection of Christianity, anyone's acceptance or rejection of Christianity is based to a large degree on what you think about Jesus. What you believe about Jesus. If you don't think the Gospels are factual accounts, historical accounts of a real historical man who actually lived and walked on this earth, Jesus. Or if you believe, yes, they are factual accounts of a real historical figure, but he's just an, an ordinary man who lived an extraordinary life, Or if you believe his claims show him, quite frankly, to be a bit of a nut job, clearly out of out, off his trolley, mad, making claims that, that far outweigh any man. If instead you, you believe his, his claims show him to be deluded, you know, a, a narcissistic liar. Or if instead you believe he is who he claims to be, the son of God, Come into the world to see of sinners. What you believe about Jesus will affect how you respond to him. How you respond, whether you accept or reject Christianity, the salvation that's held out to you in Christianity through this man, Jesus. So who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? It's a vitally important question. It determines, as I said, how we respond to him. So that's the question that we're asking this evening. And this question has produced a host of different answers. Some believe he's mythical. He's a, nothing more than a, a fairy story character. The Bible is a work of fiction, and no such person ever existed. Plenty of people believe that today. Some believe, yes, he was a real person who lived around 2,000 years ago, but nothing more than an ordinary man who lived an extraordinary life, giving us an example of how we should live, how we can and, and should live to endear ourselves to God. But he was a good man, but nothing more. Some claim that what he said about himself, the claims that he, he made about himself as recorded in the gospel, his claims to be God, shown to be a nutcase, a deluded madman. Crazy. They said it when he was alive, and they said today. Others say his claims to be God show him to be wicked. We we read some in, in our passage reports of, of some men in his day who said his claims to be God were nothing more than wicked. He was a liar, a blasphemer, a malevolent narcissist. Some go as far to say, as we read in our passage, that he was possessed by a demon. He did what he did, the power of the devil. While Christians believe that his claims, we acknowledge him as the son of God, come into the world to see of sinners through his life of perfect obedience and his atoning death on the cross. We accept his claims. We believe who he says he is. We trust him as God's promised savior. And those are the five basic beliefs about who Jesus is. He's mythical. 
He's a moralizer. He's, he's a good man, a good example. He's a maniac. He's a deluded narcissist. He's malevolent, a wicked liar. Or he's a messiah. Five beliefs, a summary of the five beliefs, what you believe, what anyone believes about Jesus. Those are the five claims about Jesus we're going to examine this evening. Firstly, the belief, the claim that he is mythical. He is mythical. Speak to people about Jesus, and you'll find that this is what many people believe about Jesus. He's mythical. And that's not based on, on years of research or any research at, at all for many people, simply because it's what they choose to believe. Jesus is mythical. He wasn't a real person, completely made up. They believe that, that this, this book, the Bible, is, is a, a com- work of complete fiction. It's a, the figment of someone's imagination or, or, or a series of, of different people's imaginations. Same way that Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, or Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves is, is a work of fiction. The Bible is exactly the same. No different. And Jesus is the, the imaginary figure at the center of this fictional work. He's no different from a, a character in a fairy story like Cinderella or Snow White. He's no more real than Luke Skywalker or Winnie the Pooh. Maybe that's what you believe about Jesus tonight. Made up. Make believe. Mythical. Well, this claim about Jesus simply doesn't stack up. There are plenty of independent historical accounts apart from the Bible, outside of the Bible, that testify to the existence, the the real existence of of this man, Jesus, confirm Jesus' existence as a real historical figure. He really, truly existed. Accounts written not by Christians, not even by people who are favorable to the Christian faith, but hostile to Christianity, hostile to Christians. But accounts that corroborate the facts of Jesus' existence, his ministry, his crucifixion, and his claimed resurrection. The Jewish, Jewish historian Josephus, the historian Thallus, the Roman historians Tacitus, Suetonius, Plinius, Secundus, all confirmed the existence of a man called Jesus who performed marvelous, merit, miraculous deeds. He was condemned to crucifixion by Pontius Pilate, and he was reported to have appeared to his disciples three days after his death. Historical corroboration by writers who weren't Christians, who weren't favorable to Christians, who despised Christians, some of these writers. Jesus was not a fictional character. We have the gospel records themselves. You know, eyewitness accounts of, of Jesus' life written by men who were with him, who knew him, who heard him, who spent time with him, who saw him, who touched him, who heard the things that they wrote about. You know, the, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are not fanciful fairy stories. They're not made up myths. They are eyewitness accounts of real, actual, historical events. Same way you you go into a courtroom and someone sits in the witness box beside the judge, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and they give an eyewitness account, be it of a road accident or, or an attempted murder, whatever. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are reports of eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life and death. Events these men actually saw, heard, experienced with Jesus. Now, maybe you're you're sitting there and you're thinking, but are they? Are they? Are they really? I hear what you're saying, but but are they? How can we be sure that that these gospel accounts are records of of real events? And we looked at this in in quite some depth. That was a number of months ago now, whenever we asked the question, can I believe the Bible? And if you're asking those questions this evening, can I believe the gospels? Go back and listen to that study. Can I believe the Bible? But one of the things that we saw in that study was the fact that these gospel accounts were written by people very soon after Jesus' death. They were written very soon after the events took place, when there were plenty of people alive who would have been only too pleased, only too glad to dispute them 
if the Gospels contained accounts and, and records of things that they knew were false, didn't take place, and would have been very quick to put up their hand and say, that's a lie, that didn't happen, and we know it didn't happen. But they didn't. No one did. Because they knew, all of them knew that these events took place. Exactly as recorded in the gospel. And we can be sure, again, something else we looked at in, in that study, can we believe the Bible? We can be sure that what we have in our Bibles today is what those men wrote down almost 2,000 years ago. Well, yes, it was about 2,000 years ago today. We can be sure that what we have today in our Bibles is exactly what they wrote because of the sheer volume of manuscripts that we have from that time proving that what we have today is what they actually wrote. It hasn't been distorted, hasn't been changed, hasn't been manipulated over 2,000 years. What we have is what they actually wrote. The manuscript record we know for the gospel, for the, for the New Testament, is far, far greater than any manuscript record for any other historical book or historical writing. Homer's Iliad, Julius Caesar's record of the, the, the Gallic Wars are have, have only a fraction of the manuscripts that we have for the New Testament and the gospel, yet historians never question them. You know, do we have what Julius Caesar wrote? Do we have what Homer wrote? They accept it as, as, as being correct copies, exactly what they wrote down, and yet the manuscript record is far, 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 far less. There are over 24,000 manuscripts, manuscript segments in the New Testament alone from the time of it's been written, proving that what we have today in our Bibles is what these eyewitnesses wrote 2,000 years ago. We can have confidence that what we have today in our New Testaments and in the Gospels is what these New Testament writers wrote 2,000 years ago. And what we have recorded, the eyewitness accounts of the life of a man called Jesus, written by men who heard and saw these things. That's a very brief summary of some of the things we looked at in, in our previous study. We can be sure. We can be sure that the gospel accounts are records of real events. They are accurate eyewitness accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus. He is not a figment of someone's imagination. That's nonsense. He is not the figment of someone's imagination. He is not the stuff of myth and make-believe. He is a real historical figure. The second claim that we have about Jesus, the second thing that people believe about Jesus is that he's a moralizer. He is a moralizer. Okay, they say he's real. He, he's not fictional. He's not mythical. He's a real historical figure. He lived and walked on the earth 2,000 years ago. Okay, but he's just a man, an ordinary man, a good man, yes, an, an extraordinarily good man who gives us an example of, of how we should live, how we can and should live to please God. That's all he is, nothing more. An ordinary man who lived an extraordinarily good life, who shows us the type of life that we should, that we can and should live to please God. He shows us how to be good people, how to honor our parents, how to submit to those in authority, even when it hurts he shows us how to love our neighbors, to be good neighbors, to do to others as you would have them do to you, to turn the other cheek. He shows us how we're to, to love our enemies, how we're to put others before ourselves, how we're to sacrifice our wishes, even our well-being for the, the wishes and, and the well-being of others. An extraordinarily good man who gives us an example of the life we're to live to please God and earn God's favor. That's who Jesus is. Nothing more, nothing less. Just a good man. And maybe that's what you believe about Jesus this evening as you're, you're sitting here listening. 
He's a moralizer. He's a moral example, a moral target, as it were. We read about Jesus here, and we set this as a moral target. This is how I should live to make myself right with God and, and get into heaven. Well, is he just a moral, a moral man? Is he just a good example? Well, that claim doesn't stack up either. And remember the, the Gospels, the accounts of, of Jesus' life and ministry written by eyewitnesses to the actual events that they record. Eyewitness accounts, remember, we can rely on as, as accurate. Well, in those Gospels, we read Jesus' claim to be God. He said he was God. In Mark chapter 2, whenever we, we read of him healing the paralyzed man, he said to that man as he was lowered down through the hole in the roof and, and he lay on the ground in front of him, the first thing he said to him, he said, son, your sins are forgiven you. He claimed to be able to do something that only God could do. He was claiming to be God, something that, that the Pharisees in his midst knew he was doing immediately because they accused him at that moment of blasphemy. John chapter 8, he said to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, before Abraham was born, you know, your father Abraham that you revere, the, the father of Judaism, before Abraham was, I am. And he wasn't only claiming to exist, have existed before Abraham, he took the name of God, I am. The name of God that he revealed it to, to Moses out of the burning bush, and he took it for, for himself, he was claiming to be God. And again, that was something that the Pharisees, the scribes, recognized because they took up stones to, to stone him, to kill him for blasphemy. They knew he was claiming to be God. John 5, 18, we read, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Again and again and again in his ministry, he claimed to be God. So if he wasn't God, and he was just an ordinary man, an everyday five-eighths man like the rest of us, well, then he was lying. He was blaspheming, wasn't he? He wasn't telling the truth. And if in claiming to be God, he was telling lies, he was blaspheming, he was holding him out, himself out to be something that he wasn't, holding himself out to be God himself, something that we see in Scripture, God abhors, and, and he shows his anger at again and again and again in his word, then if he was doing that, he might be a lot of things. But he certainly wasn't a good man. His claim to be God precludes him, precludes us from saying, oh, he was just a good man. By claiming to be God, he cannot simply be a good man. He's either a liar or he is who he says he is. He cannot simply be a good man. The third claim or belief about Jesus and who he is is that he's a maniac. He's mad. You know, he's, he, okay, he's not a fictional character, people say. He, he's, he's a real, genuine, historical figure who, who walked, lived on the earth 2,000 years ago who claimed to be God. He claimed to be God, a claim that clearly shows he was schizophrenic. He was a nut job, deluded, mad. You know, if anybody come up to you today, you know, going to school tomorrow and, and a classmate come up to you and said, I'm God. Go into the workplace tomorrow when somebody says, actually, I'm God. Go walk into the square on, on Saturday and somebody in the middle of the square and they say, I'm God. What's the first thing that you would think of them? There's air getting in there somewhere. Now, there's, there's, this, there's a few sandwiches short of a picnic, this guy. He's mad. And the, the Gospels, we, we read of people who, who thought this way about Jesus. Now, we, in, in Mark chapter 3, that passage we, we read not so very long ago, we read how his own family tried to seize him and, and take him home. And they said to themselves, we read, he said, he's out of his mind. Mary, taking some of his brothers out of concern for her son, she genuinely thinks he's out of his mind. He's mad. Matthew 13, when Jesus was speaking in the town of Nazareth where he grew up, 
the people said to themselves, and we read in verse 55, they said, this is Jesus, the carpenter's son. This is the son of Mary. This is the brother of James and, and Joseph. They were thinking to themselves, hold on a minute, mate. I know your dad. I know your mum. I've watched you grow up. I sat be be behind you in school. You're not God. You're just like the rest of us. You're a nut job. That's what you are. And maybe that's what you believe about Jesus. Okay, he was, he was a genuine, real historical figure. But his claims show him to be crazy. And Christianity is a religion based around the claims of a crazy person. But this claim doesn't stack up either. Again, go back to the gospel accounts. Gospel accounts of his life and ministry written shortly after his death, which could have been disputed very easily if they contained anything at all inaccurate. Accounts that we can rely on as an accurate record of his life and ministry. These gospel accounts record Jesus performing a whole litany of miracles. We read of some of them in, in our passage in Mark chapter 3. Just think of some of the miracles we, we read in the gospels. Turning water into wine. Calming the storms on, on the Sea of Galilee. Walking on water. Casting out demons, feeding a crowd of, on a number of occasions, a crowd of over 5,000 people with five loaves and, and two fish, healing all manner of illnesses, blindness, deafness, paralysis, leprosy, even raising people from the dead, Jairus' daughter, his friend Lazarus. If he was nothing but a schizophrenic, if he was nothing but a nut job, if his claim to be God was a product of a damaged mind, he wouldn't have been able to do these miraculous works. And you can't dismiss these miracles as, as never having happened. Okay, right, but those things never happened. They're just made up. If his enemies had been able to refute his miracles, to say that they hadn't happened, you can bet your bottom dollar they would have done so very very quickly, extremely gladly, but they couldn't. Nowhere in the Gospels do we read of, of the Pharisees, the scribes, denying the actual occurrence of these miracles because they couldn't. They knew they happened. They'd seen them happen. They knew that crowds of thousands had seen them happen. And to say that they hadn't happened was to open themselves up to a blatant charge of lying. And unable to deny Jesus' miracles, they said in Mark chapter 3, as we had read, okay, yes, he's done these miracles. They confessed. They said, yes, he's done these miracles. But he's done them in the power of the devil. They couldn't deny the miracles had happened. They had to admit, yes, he's done these miracles. But they said, he's done them in the power of the devil. That's all they could come up with. Jesus' miracles, undisputed, in the reliable gospel accounts of his life and ministry, Prove emphatically that he was no deluded maniac. He was no schizophrenic. Mythical, moralizer, a maniac. The fourth claim or belief about Jesus and who he is is that he's malevolent. He's wicked. He's evil. Okay, people say he's, he's, he's not fictional. I accept he's a real historical character. He lived and, and walked on the earth 2,000 years ago. He's not mad. He's not just a good man, but he's not from God. He's a liar. He was lying. He's wicked. He did what he did in the power of the devil. And that, as we saw, that's what the scribes say in Mark chapter 3. They said he claims to be the son of God. He claims to be doing these miracles in the power of God, but he's not. He's from the devil. He's doing these things through the power of the devil. It's the devil. They say that's empowering him to cast out these demons and, and perform these miracles. And people say the same today. He's a fraud. He's a liar. He did what he did, not in the power of God. He's not the son of God. Empowered by some other being, a demonic being, the devil. And that claim doesn't stack up either. You know, read. Go home this evening and, and read again 
the account of Jesus' life in the Gospels, his teaching, his compassion, his sacrifice, his love, his selflessness, his giving of himself on the cross, this man is no devil. This man is no devil. He is the living embodiment of everything good. I challenge you to, to read the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and find anything in any way that falls even the slightest bit short of perfect. He's no devil. He's no demon. And as for the claims of his enemies that the miracles that he performed were the work of the demons, the devil, done in the power of the devil, what nonsense. You know, we, we read in the Gospels the work of the devil and, and what he did through his demons, the pain they were inflicting on, on people's lives by possessing them, and the things that those demons were, were compelling those whom they possessed to do. Jesus' ministry stood in complete contrast to what the devil and, and his demons were inflicting on in people's lives. He, he wasn't uh, imposing and, and restricting and, and harming and hurting them. He was freeing them. He was releasing people from demonic activity. Mark chapter 3, we, we read Jesus' response to these very claims, to, to the scribes and the Pharisees who accused him of, of being from the devil. He says, what you're saying, you know, it's a logical ar argument. He says, what you're saying is that in my casting out demons, that the devil is fighting against himself. That's what you're saying. You're saying, I'm from the devil. So in casting out demons, the devil is fighting against himself. He says, there's no way the devil would start fighting against himself, his own demons, and start casting them out. He says, if demons are being defeated and cast out, it's not the devil who's doing it. And he goes on to explain exactly what he's come to do and whose power he's doing it. He says in, in verse 27, no one can, can enter a strong man's house and plunder his good, goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then he can plunder the house. He's using the picture of a, well, a household burglary is, is what he's describing here. A break-in. He says a, a burglar can't just break into the home and, and make off with, with the house owner's property. First, he has to overcome the strong man. He has to tie him up before he can rummage through his house and make off with his things. He says that burglar has to be stronger than the homeowner in order to steal his stuff. He's saying here in, in this parable that Satan is the strong man. He is wielding power and control over the people he possesses. And if anyone is going to be freed from Satan's dominion and control, if they're to be rescued from the release of Satan, then Satan has to be bound. He has to be overcome. He has to be tied up. It takes someone stronger than Satan to rescue those whom he controls. And he says, that's who I am. That's why I've come. I've come to defeat Satan. I've not come to help him. I've not come to assist him, to further his work. I've come to free people from him, not to entrap them. I'm not doing this in Satan's power. I'm no demon-possessed devil. I'm doing it through a greater power than Satan's. God's power. Because I'm God. It's blatantly obvious that Jesus is no malevolent devil-empowered demon. It's a blasphemous claim of rebellious hearts in which that claim is based. Simple logic, simple reason exposes this as nonsense. Mythical, moralizer, maniac, or malevolent. The fifth belief that people have about Jesus is that he's a Messiah. It's the only option remaining. That he is who he says he is, the Messiah. The Son of God come into the world to save sinners, exactly who he claims to be. That's who the Bible reveals him to be. 
That's who the Bible reveals Jesus to be. The gospel record of his life and ministry records his claims to be the Messiah, the Son of God. His claims to be God himself, equal with God the Father. His claims to be God's promised Savior, the one who would save his people from their sins, the one who would take God's punishment upon himself so that those who trust him could be freed and forgiven. Claims that are overwhelmingly backed up, proven by his behavior, by his life, by what we see of him, what we see, not only what he teaches, but what he does, the power and authority that he wielded, the miracles that he wrought, that proved him to be who he claimed to be. Power, miracles that were blatantly obvious to anybody who had eyes. He cannot be anyone other than he claims to be. The only reasonable, logical conclusion to arrive at when you examine the eyewitness testimony of Jesus' life and ministry is that he's not mythical, not a, a figment of someone's imagination. He isn't simply a moralizer, a good person to give us a good example. He's not a maniac, you know, a deluded narcissist. He isn't malevolent. He's not wicked, demon-possessed. He's the Messiah, the Son of God, come into the world to save sinful men and women. That's who he is. But it's not enough to know who he is. It's good, and it's a good start, but it's not enough. The most important thing is how you respond to who he is. And I said at the start that what you believe about Jesus will affect how you respond to him. Knowing who Jesus is, knowing that he is the Messiah, then how are you to respond to him? Well, he tells us how we're to respond to him. In this passage in Mark 3 that we read, we're to turn to him in faith. We're to believe who he is, trusting that he is who he says he is. Trusting that in his life, he lived a life that we could never live. Trusting that on his death on the cross, he took the punishment that you deserve for your sins. And he tells us in verse 28 of Mark chapter 3, the outcome, the result of believing in him and what he's done. He says, all your sins, completely forgiven. Completely forgiven. Put away, punished in him. What a tremendous promise, the promise of complete forgiveness, complete atonement, complete cleansing from everything wrong you've ever done, every sin of everyone who turns to him in repentance and faith, just by simply believing who he is and what he's done. And he warns us in the next verse, he warns us in verse 29, that if you persist in going against the evidence, if you persist in saying he isn't the Son of God, despite all the evidence, if you persist in saying, oh, he's a myth, he's a moralizer, he's a, he's a maniac, or he's from the devil, he says, you're guilty of an eternal sin for which there is no forgiveness. An eternal sin with an eternal punishment. And he says, that's what you'll receive. That's his warning. I've presented the evidence this evening. And you all, you all know in your hearts that it's true. You all know in your hearts who Jesus really is, don't you? And what he requires of you to receive this forgiveness. Simple humble, submissive, childlike faith. And if you persist in going against this message, very similar to what we saw this morning, if you persist, Jesus says, in going against what you know in your hearts to be true, if you persist in your opposition and you continue to reject his free offer of forgiveness, he says, you're guilty of an eternal sin for which there's an eternal punishment. And that's what you'll receive. 
So I urge you tonight, if you haven't accepted Jesus and trusted him as the Savior, you know in your hearts that he is. You know he is. If you haven't accepted him as your Savior thus far in your life, I urge you tonight, do just that. So that you might know your sins forgiven. All, all your sins forgiven. Know that you're made right with God and will enjoy eternal peace and happiness with him. Because if you don't, if you continue to deny who he really is and who you know him to be, you're guilty of an eternal sin with an eternal punishment. And that, that's what you'll receive. Amen. Amen.